Welcome, dear viewers, and join us as we go through the ninth lesson of the Cornerstone lesson in the first quarter of the 2024 uh, connection. My name is Michael Flex, and on the panel we have Grace, Ashley, Alvin, and on the orchestra we have Subira and Sherman. Enjoy. Hello everyone, and today I will be taking you through today's mission, uh, all the way from India, banged up bike. Judah usually walked to church. The church was just up the road from his house, and it only took five minutes by foot. Usually he walked with his parents. But one day he was waiting for his parents to get ready. Judah had a bright idea to ride his bicycle to church. Father and mother warned him that to not take his bicycle to church. They said he did not need to go by bike because the church was so close. They were also worried that he might get into an accident. But Judah loved to ride his bike. It was a marvelous bike painted yellow with black trim. He thought, if I go now, they won't know. They won't see me. He didn't stop to think what would happen when his parents saw the bike at church. He just wanted to go. Judah went outside and very, very quietly pushed the bicycle to the front gate. Once outside the gate, he got onto the bike. He felt very excited. He felt like he should go very fast to church, so he pedaled as fast as he could. He didn't understand why his parents had forbidden him from riding his bike to church. The road went up a hill from his house to the church. He didn't even need to turn. It did not seem dangerous. As Judah pedaled as fast as he could up the hill, he quickly got tired. He stopped for a moment at an intersection to catch his breath. At that moment, he, had, he heard the roar of a motorcycle. The motorcyclist didn't even try to stop. He was coming too fast as Judah stopped his bike. The motorcycle slammed into him. The yellow bike with black trim was crushed. Judah felt okay. He looked over at the motorcyclist. He hadn't been wearing a helmet, and his head was bleeding. Judah saw the blood and was scared. If he dies, I'll go to jail, he thought. If, he, if I go to jail, my parents will kill me. Neighbors came running. Someone gave water to the motorcyclist. Someone washed his head and asked how he felt. Then someone asked Judah how he felt. I'm fine, Judah said. Then he heard the neighbors arguing over who had caused the accident. Some said Judah was to blame. Others said the motorcyclist was at fault. Someone ran to Judah's house and told his parents. Father came and helped clear the crowd. Why didn't you listen to me? He asked Judah. The boy didn't say anything. If something happens to you, what will your mother and I do? I'm sorry, Judah hung his head and said. Father picked up the mangled bike and carried it home. Mother met the pair on the way. At the house, father, mother, and Judah prayed. Thank you, God, for saving my son, father said. Then mother and treated Judah's cuts. He declared that he was fine. That night, however, Judah woke up with a pain in his arm. He went to the hospital the next day and learned that he had fractured his elbow. It was painful, but he got better after a while. After the accident, Judah was banned from riding bicycles until he's 16. Now he is 13, and it seems to like a long time to wait. He remembers the accident every time he walks to church. He wishes that he had listened to his parents. He misses his bicycle, but he's grateful for God, to God for protecting him. God saved me, he said. It would have been a lot worse. Everyone who looks at my wrecked bike says, God saved you. Part of this quarter's 13th Sabbath offering will help construct a church near Judah's school in Bengaluru, India. Judah's school is on the same campus as Lurie Adventist College. Thank you for planning a generous offering.
welcome to this lesson that was day by day and with each passing moment. I hope you enjoyed the song. Um, today we are going to learn about Never Alone and on this panel I'll introduce to you those who are with me starting from my father's right. Hello dear viewers, my name is Mikael Flex. Hello everyone, my name is Grace Washeke. Uh, hello everyone, my name is Avin Mosomi. And I am Ashley Silas and I'll be the moderator for today. Before we begin, I'd like Flex to pray for us. Let us bow our heads for out of prayer. Father, in the mighty name of Jesus, we come before you, Lord, to humbly request that you send your Holy Spirit. Lord, as we go through this lesson, O Lord, may you reveal your light, O mighty Father. And may we not speak our own words, but your words, O mighty Father. And may all who are listening be blessed, O Lord, and may we all glorify your name. And may we all wait, O Lord, and be there, O Lord, in your soon and second return, O mighty Father. For this I pray in Jesus' name, amen. 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 Um, the topic today is never alone, and we are talking about Elijah just after his mountaintop experience. Now, I'd like to give each one of us an illustration here. And the illustration reads that during the terrible days of blitz, a father holding his small son by the hand ran from a building that had been struck by a bomb. In the front yard was a shell hole. Seeking shelter as quickly as possible, the father jumped into the hole and held his arms out for his son to follow. Terrified yet hearing his father's voice telling him to jump, the boy replied, I can't see you. The father, looking up, against the sky tinted red by the burning buildings, called up to the silhouette of his son, but I can see you, jump. The boy jumped because he trusted his father. The Christian faith enables us to face life or meet death, not because we can see, but with the certainty that we are seen, not knowing that we, not that we know all the answers, but that we are known. So with that, I'd like um, to go into the word you think section uh, so to begin the what do you think section God sometimes refers to himself as a father or a mother and Jesus refers to himself as a brother if you were in a hard difficult or even life-threatening situation in your life who would you want to be there rank them in order of one beginning from the highest to ten being the lowest so the people here are mother father sister brother, and lastly, best friend. So who would you like to be there in a life-threatening situation? So I can begin. For me, I think this order really captures what I will, who I like to be in my life-threatening situation. Mm -hmm. My mother, because, well, she's the closest with me. Um, maybe I'll put my brother, then my father, because he talk more to my brothers than my dad. And my sister being the youngest, yeah, and then my best friend. And this really, for me, is how I'll put them in my list. Mm -hmm. Yes, Grace. For me, like Flex, I would have my mom, because I'm really close to her. And then my dad. Four siblings. Can't really relate. And then, <laughs> then uh -huh. maybe my best friend, yeah. Okay, I'd say my father, because I think he'd protect me. My mother because yeah, she, she will provide the emotional stability I'd need. I didn't want my siblings to be there because I'm the eldest. I'd want them not to be in any, any life-threatening situation. My best friend, I'd of course want my best friend to be there because I can be open with her and she, will, she knows me quite well, so she will give the best advice on what to do and what not to do knowing me. But I didn't want her to be in a life-threatening situation. I feel like <clears throat> I feel like my list is totally controversial to the list because first of all, I want my father to be there. Then secondly, I like my best friend to be there because yeah, just like that. Then probably my mother, then my sister, then my brother. Lastly, but so like my sister is like the person I don't want to be. It's like. All of them are really important so that it's like one is most important, the other one is least important, yeah. Okay, not necessarily least important. You it's can like, say least important, yeah, it's, but it's like, they're not that close or yeah, they wouldn't understand. They're still important, you. but one is more important than the other. 
Okay, yeah. I, I don't think I'm, I'd touch any importance because they're not, not necessarily equally important, but there's a degree of importance. Like they're all important, but in a different way. Yeah. Yeah. So just before the story, there are times when we have a glitch, when we have hiccups in this life, when we don't know whether to turn left or to the right, and the things that we see or the ways that seem like um, suggestions to get us out of the problem are not easy, not at all. So it was with Elijah. Over and over again, he trusted God to get him out of the situation. Even when God tells him to jump, it seems easier to do it our own way, and his idea to step out in faith is better for him in the end. So as we read the story, I hope that we will keep this in mind. Yes, let's go into the story. Okay, so we're going to get into the story. And our story, as we've heard from Ashley here, is about Elijah. And it comes from the book of First Kings 17, 1 through 16. You can go read it at your own free time, but I'm going to give just a brief summary of it. So... God told Elijah to go tell the king of the time, King Ahab, who was a very wicked man, that because of the way he had led Israel into sin by worshipping Baal, because of him being influenced by his wife, Queen Jezebel, that there is not going to be any rain for three years or until, you know, when the Lord said that now, you know, rain can finally fall on this land. So this was a very tough message, but... You know, Elijah went ahead and carried it out anyway. And God knew that this would put his life in danger. So as soon as he got out of the king's court, after delivering the message, God told him to flee eastward and go to the brook of Cherith, where he was going to provide for him. So Elijah did as God told him. And every single day, birds would come, ravens to be more precise, Ravens would come and feed him bread and meat in the morning and in the evening, every day. And the brook Cherith was what used to keep him, you know, hydrated. But if you're in the middle of a famine, you, you can tell that a brook is not going to last very long. And this was, the very, this was what happened. So after a while, the brook dried up. But God did not forget his servant and said, I want you to go to the village of Zarephath, which is in Sidon. There I have commanded a widow to feed you. So Elijah once again did as God had told him to. And when he got to the city, he saw the widow, although I don't think that at first he knew it was the widow, but anyway, but he saw this widow collecting sticks. And so he asked her if he could have some water. And as she went to go fetch it for him, he also asked her if she could go get some bread for him. And now this is when, in my imagination, the lady just turned around very slowly and told Elijah exactly what was going on, that she was collecting sticks to go light a fire in order for her to bake the last, you know, the last loaf of bread because she only had a handful of flour and just a little bit of oil. So she wanted to go use that to bake the last loaf of bread so that she and her son could eat and then wait to die. But then Elijah told, Elijah told, him, I mean, Elijah told her, sorry, to go and you know, bake a small piece of bread for him first and then bake for, her, for herself and her son because the Lord has now promised her that she is not going to run out of food. So in an act of faith, she went ahead and baked the bread for Elijah but then found that that handful of flour that she thought was there had actually increased and the oil was more too. And the Lord made sure that that family never ran out of food. Amen, amen. Um... What, what, what do you think this story, just before we, we, we think, say what we think about the story, Flex, could you read us the key text? Yes, the key text comes from First Kings chapter 17, verse 4 to 6. And it says, It shall be that you will drink of the brook, and I have commanded the ravens to provide for you there. So he went and did according to the word of the Lord. The ravens brought him bread, and meat in the morning, and bread and meat in the evening, and he would drink from the brook. So we, we, we begin this lesson by the key verse, and the key verse highlights God's providence. It highlights that even though he's sending Elijah to do some perilous job, he's still providing. It shall be 
that you will drink from the brook, and I have commanded Drevens to provide for you there. So, Avi, what do you think about the story? <coughs> I feel like I feel like God was testing Elijah at some point because, first of all, he sent, he sent Elijah to the king and told him that your land, there shall be no rain for three years because of what you've done. Then furthermore, instead of giving Elijah like a prosperous life, like a comfortable life, now he tells him, now you flee, go to this brook. And eventually, Elijah realized that this brook is not going to give me water till rain comes back. So... Elijah had to have constant faith that the Lord will be protecting him. And even he didn't know if he's going to tell the king that there will be no rain, he wouldn't be killed. He was, he was having faith throughout the journey. When he went to the brook, he had faith. When he was being told to go to the widow of Zarephath, he had to have faith because what if there was no widow there? What if the widow decided, I'm going to cook the next day, not today, I'm not going to pick sticks today? So he had to have faith. I feel like He's displaying faith throughout this entire story. Oh, if I can touch on that. I also feel from this story how you could see how much love he had for God. Because if, you're, if you are told to go and deliver a punishment, right, to a certain group of people, you will never expect the punishment to be for yourself, mm -hmm, right? Mm -hmm. So imagine how much love it, he had to have for God to actually tell people we are all going to suffer together. And not because I did anything wrong. Because of what you did, there won't be rain for three years until mm -hmm. you all come back to the mm -hmm. Lord of, mm -hmm. of our land. So there had to be a lot of love and trust in the Lord God Almighty for his people and in the Lord. Because to do that, yeah, not easy. In Psalm 139 verse 21, David says, Do I not hate them, O Lord, who hate you? And do I not love those who rise up against you? I hate them with perfect hate hatred i count them my enemies this is what is going on in elijah's mind he is filled with deep sorrow deep sorrow for the for the the israelites because they have turned away against their maker and ellen white says that each revival was followed with deeper apostasy. Every revival was followed with deeper apostasy. They've been aposted since the day they stepped their foot in the land of Canaan. And Elijah's heart has gone forth and he's pleading with God that he will do something to cause them to know that he is God. And so this story takes place and he goes before Ahab and he gives God's judgment. But you find that they believe that, well, Baal is the one who's supposed to provide rain, and they keep killing the animals that they would use for food in the three years of famine. Instead of repenting, they're killing this animal. And he says, um, he says, uh, what does Elijah say? Eli Elijah says, your God is meditating. He might not be hearing you guys. I mean, he might be asleep. So you find that they are called to believe they are called to repent, and even during the judgment, they are apostatizing during the display of judgment. So we'll go into the art of the story. Okay, so we have some questions here, and we may not be able to go through all of them because of time. If you have the lesson, please go ahead and take a look at them. So this is rather open-ended, and maybe we can have two people telling us how God has provided for them in their lives? Well, I could say that God's providence is moment by moment basis. It's been here before, it will be here now and forever. Like the breath we breathe every moment. Of course, there are times when we need God to do the big acts of providence, like you need to go to school and there's no money. You need to, you are sick and you're not able to get medical fees or you need healing. And that is a time when God provides for every one of us. Uh, that's a very good answer, actually. I was going to head to that. Because if you actually, let's say you've come to the end of the year, like right now, right? And you take a look at your, your lifespan or even the, pre the previous year. Mm -hmm. You can just see how much God has provided for you till where you are at that moment. And... It's fascinating because in each trial, you always feel like, oh, how am I going to get out of this? 
oh, what's happening? Oh, and it may be for a long period of time, a short period of time, but eventually, uh, by the grace of God, get out of it. And the more you look back, the more you see it is true that God was in my life and he has been providing for me all that time. Mm-hmm. You know, it's, it's, it's interesting that just because God doesn't necessarily provide for us by sending ravens to bring us food and a brook flowing or flour multiplying in the jar, it doesn't mean that he's not with us. Turning over our lives does not mean we will never have bad things happen in us or anything go wrong, but trusting that God will get you out right on the end. In giving God his life, Elijah, and in obeying him, the situation was dangerous. He entrusted himself to God's care. He did not doubt. And he, at one point in his life, whether God was really going to protect him, protect him, even to the point when God asked him to kill, like, if it meant that his life would be sacrificed, he was ready to do that. In the flashlight, I'd ask Flex to read for us the flashlight. The flashlight comes from Pretext, Prophets and Kings, uh, page 119. The word of faith and power was upon his, Elijah's, lips, and his whole life was devoted to the works of reform. His was the voice of one crying in the wilderness to rebuke sin and press back the tide of evil. And while he came to the people as a reprover of sin, his message offered the balm of Gilead, to the sin-sick souls of all who desired to be healed. To the sin-sick souls of all who desired to be healed. I think that's what I would underline in this statement. We live in a world where there are sin-sick souls who are looking for healing, who seek for satisfaction in every single thing and every single place, and they are unable to find satisfaction. They are unable to find something that fills this gap that is in their hearts. And we are to be the words We are to be the voice of the one crying in the wilderness. We are to prepare the way for the Lord. Um, Elijah is likened unto John the Baptist. And John the Baptist is also known as the one whose voice was crying in the wilderness to prepare the way of the Lord. He had the spirit of Elijah and so is to be with all of us in this day and age. We are to go forth in the spirit of Elijah to prepare the way to state sin by its rightful name. In fact, interesting, interestingly enough, when mm-hmm. John the Baptist came on the scene, people asked if he was Elijah. Very actually. true. And I'd ask that, how do you think that this kind of zeal and enthusiasm would be met, met today? And do we know anyone who exhibits such zeal and enthusiasm for the word of God? Well, it might be, we might not be able to answer the question, and it might be a rhetorical question for us. How can we exhibit this enthusiasm in our day-to-day lives, even as we live? We will go straight to the punchline. Avin. Um, The first punchline. Do not fear, for I'm with you. Do not be anxious. Do not anxiously look about you, for I'm your God. I will strengthen you. Surely I'll help you. Surely I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. So what do you think this verse says to you as a person? I feel like this is an assurance that God is with us all the time Mm -hmm. and he's always there to help us. Okay. Here's the Luke 1, 17. In Luke 1, 17, it reads, It is he who will go as a forerunner before him in the, pr- in the spirit and power of Elijah to turn the hearts of the fathers back to the children and the disobedient to the, ad- to the attitude of the righteous so as to make ready a people prepared for the Lord. I'd like you to underline the, the, the part of to turn the hearts of the fathers back to the children and the disobedient to the attitude of the righteous. What do you think this verse is saying to you as a person and to us who are listening? I mean, personally, I think, I mean, like, we, we'd expect for it to say to turn the heart of the children back to the fathers. Mm-hmm. Because, you know, like, typically that's what happens with the children who go slightly astray. But then, in this case, it's like the fathers who've pretty much gone astray at this point. Mm-hmm. I mean, this, this has shown how bad society can get. Like, yes. if you have to show, if you have to turn uh, the parents' attention back to, to their the child, uh-huh. 
that's, that's pretty serious for me. Mm -hmm. So, you know, we ha like if things have gotten that bad, we really need, you know, the message of Jesus, you know, to turn us back to the right way, to the way things are supposed to be. James 1, 5, verse, James 5, verse 17, Flex, what do you think? So it says, Elijah was a man with a nature like ours, and he prayed earnestly that it will not rain. And it did not rain on the earth for three years and six months. Mm -hmm. Now, this just shows how, though he was a great prophet, he was just a man like, like us. us. And you'll see this in, in, in the future lessons that are about to come, so stay tuned. But it just shows you that even us, with our normal natures and through all this um, uh, very uh, discouraging society, right? Uh, it just shows that if we pray, God still hears. And if, you are, if your heart is right with God and it's for the right intentions, then he will answer your prayers and it will be for the glory and honor of his name at the end of the results. Amen, amen. You know, I'd want to, I want us to think about the woman of Zarephath. And I want us to think about her dire situation and how in her dire situation she helped the man of God. Flex, if you have a <laughs> hundred shillings in your M-Pesa and you're going home and you meet a child on the street and this child is dying of hunger or needs medicine, would you give you a hundred shillings? To be honest, not necessarily. I would have gone home. You would have gone home? I would have gone home. You know, I'm thinking that many times we look at our necessities, we look at what we need, and we forget that there are those who are in more dire situations than we are. And the Father inside says, all who in time of trial and want give sympathy and assistance to others more needy, God has promised a great blessing. He has not changed his power no less now than in the days of Elijah. God has promised a blessing to if we are in needy and we give the little that we have to those who are more needy. He has promised a blessing. His power is no less today and he has no change. Um, if there was a point in your lifetime when you're especially in need of help, when was it? Did someone come and give you help you needed or you were left to fend for yourself? Being in a situation that proves difficult and dealing with it alone isn't easy. What should you do in a difficult situation? Did you call on God? Did he answer you? Many times we may not know what to do, where to turn, what to say, or who to talk to. We may feel alone and deserted. I'd like um, Flex to read for us Philippians chapter 4, verse 6 and 7. Philippians as, chapter yeah. 4, verse 6 and 7 says, Be anxious for nothing, but in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. Be anxious for nothing. That is what I would like to underline. And that's the message I want us to take home. Even though our topic says never alone, I want us to add the point of be anxious for nothing. Because when we are alone, we need to be anxious for nothing, knowing that God is with us. He says in prayer and in supplication, request, bring your requests forth to God. One of the most difficult things for people in their lives is the hard times where they have to completely rely on God for help. Naturally, as humans, we would like to take things into our own hands and do it our own way. God repeatedly told the children of Israel to put their faith in him. Many times they did and were blessed, but often they tried to do these th things in their own way and ended up in a lot of trouble. When are some times when God did come through for you? Was it in a way you expected? Or is it in a way that worked out well but wasn't exactly what you had in mind? And why do you think it happened that way? These are questions I'd like us to ponder upon. Sometimes when we pray, sometimes when we ask God for something, does he bring these things in our way? Do he, does he answer the, the prayers we ask for in our way or in the way that we think? And do we trust that he is all-knowing 
and all his purposes work together for our good. Avin, I'd like you to say something on this. What, why do you think God would do something in a way that we least expected? Um, I feel like God is the only person who truly has good intentions for us mm -hmm. because sometimes we might pray for something that we don't know in the end will come to cost us. Mm -hmm. That's why sometimes he blocks some opportunities that you may have. Sometimes you may be looking to God and saying, why have you removed this opportunity from my life? Mm -hmm. But God has seen ahead and seen that probably this opportunity will have made you draw farther from him. That's why he, he gives his answers for your best wishes. Mm -hmm. Yes. Amen, amen. Yes. And also, if you do not mind, I'd like to share a little, a little testimony. Mm -hmm. So I finished high school. At that time, I wasn't doing very well, but miraculously, God enabled me to get grades that are good enough for me to do the course that I'd wanted to do since I was a little girl, and that was medicine. And now we start the hunt of looking for universities. And, you know, like e every single person thinks that if you want to go do medicine, which is the best university for you to go? University of Nairobi. Mm -hmm. But then when we went to, you know, go check it out, I was told that my points, okay, they're good enough for doing the course of medicine, but not in the University of Nairobi. Mm -hmm. And of course, I was a bit bummed out, and now we are pretty stuck because UON has rejected me. We tried Kenyatta. We didn't really get much feedback. Eventually, I got feedback from Mount Kenya University and the University of Jaquat, Jomo Kenyatta University. And I decided to go for Jomo Kenyatta, although initially, if you'd asked me, just a few months before, like, which university would you not like to go? I would have said Jaquat, Jaquat immediately, Jaquat. Honestly, I did not even know why I chose that place and why, after so many years of going to Jaquat and falling ill because of allergies because, and dust and all that, when I went to start my studies, I did not have any allergic reaction, not even one. Amen. And then when I finally got in contact with friends who went to go do, went to go do my same course, medicine, in the University of Nairobi, I was like, praise the Lord that I'd, you did not let me go there. Mm -hmm. Because they are learning through, allow me to say, they're learning through like a lot of stress and they have a really, really tight schedule. Mm -hmm. And I know, and the Lord knows that if you put me in a situation like that, I may not be able to function so well mm -hmm. and, I may, and I may not be able to do as well as I could have. So, like, looking back and seeing the way God said, like, no, you're not going to go to UN. Mm -hmm. You're going to go to the university, which I'm going to send you to. Mm -hmm. And do not worry. If it's allergies, I will cure you of it. Amen. And right Amen. now, I am, I am really happy that God told me not to go to the University of Nairobi. Amen. Amen. That's such a wonderful testimony. Mm -hmm. And, you know, sometimes I like to ponder on how there's a statement I was told that the highest level of intelligence a man can attain in this world that's where God's foolishness, foolishness begins. Uh -huh, we cannot uh -huh. imagine, <laughs> you know, God's um, knowledge, wisdom. wisdom. Yeah. It's, yeah. it's beyond our realm of possibilities. Mm -hmm. And sometimes it's, it's, it's easier said than done because when in, in good times you can say it because everything's going well. But in hard times, it's hard to remember that because um, you're not really looking at the big picture because mm -hmm. he is. Mm -hmm. yeah. He has seen, as Anne, uh, Avin said, he has seen the future. He saw the past, mm -hmm. he has seen all variable possibilities, and he says, Flex, Grace, Ashley, Alvin, this is the way we're all going to go. Mm -hmm. And it's a really beautiful thing to trust in him, mm -hmm. but it just takes a lot of obedience and, and reading the scriptures and praying honestly as Elijah did. Mm -hmm. You have to be spiritually fed as he was given bread and water. You have to be actually be connected to Christ to actually have this trust that is built up and, and eventually grown into a level of that uh, of, of Elijah. Amen. Avin, what would be your parting shot? Um, God is the ultimate person that you should put your trust in mm -hmm. because he will give you paths that will benefit you every time because if you believe in yourself and you try your own thing, eventually you'll be doomed, mm. honestly. Eventually you'll reach a point where you now you'll have to leave everything and now start looking for God. Mm -hmm. yeah. A way that seemeth right unto a man may end yeah. in death. 
Um, as we close, I'd like to say this, that we may not see well into the future, yet God knows everything. He's all-knowing. He knows what is happening, what will happen, what has happened, and the interrelation of all these things into our day-to-day -day lives. So I'd like to implore each one of us, or ask each one of us, to trust God unconditionally. Even though at times he tells us to jump and we are not seeing him, we know that he is seeing us, and that when he says, I can see you, you trust that even though we, we cannot sin, we are certainly seen. And even though we know not all the answers, we are known. Flex, what is your parting short? My parting short is build up the relationship in Christ mm -hmm. so that you can attain the level of trust and faith like Elijah did. It's not something that you wake up and say, oh, you know, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do what the Lord tells me today because... As you've said, it's not easy to do what the Lord says. You actually have to be connected to him to be given the strength. Mm -hmm. um, because even as we grow tired in the faith, so you have to be con constantly connected to the bread of life, to the water of life, to get that um, renewment of, of, of energy to keep on with the, with the faith. Amen. Gracie, what would be your parting short? Well, my parting shot is that, you know, God can tell you to do something that is, you know, quite dangerous. I mean, look at... Elijah's case. Mm -hmm. Going to a king like Ahab well, was pretty much a death warrant, but God has promised that he's going to be with us, that we're never alone whenever he sends us to do something, whether it's something small or something dangerous or something that is challenging to you personally. Mm -hmm. He's going to be with you and guide you through every step of the way. Amen. Even as we close, the song day by day will be played and I'd like as it is played, we ponder on the words that day by day and with each passing moment, strength we find to meet our trials here. Trusting in our Father's wise bestowment, we have no cause for worry or for fear because he whose hand is ki hearts is kind beyond all measure gives unto each day what he deems best. Lovingly, it's Ming love it's, lovingly, it's part of pain and pleasure, mingling toil with peace and rest. With this, let us pray. Our kind and loving Father, we see in this that you are long-suffering. You know when we go astray, and you do everything in your power to bring us back to thee, only that we may choose you this day and avoid the judgments that would come our way if we don't. We also see that your heart is kind beyond all measure and each day, even though we have toil, you also mingle it with peace and rest. Even though there is pain, you give us pleasure once in our while, a while and you teach us in all these things to trust you. Lord, we walk into this life, we walk in paths that are unknown. They seem dark, yet we pray, Lord, that even as we walk, we should not walk because we can see, but because we are seen. Not because we know all the answers, but because we are known. We pray this trusting in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.